Good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Swing. I'm one of the elders. Uh, the privilege of being up and uh, with my family and love you guys. Uh, for those who are not with us today, I uh, love you guys too and, and hope that everybody is uh, doing well. Over the last couple of weeks, uh, there's been you know, a lot of uh, discussions with uh, regards to transformation. And uh, I started to reflect back on what transformation meant to me and, and, and what examples I had in my life about transformation. And uh, one of the things that I looked at is when I, when God got hold of my heart and, and uh, rededicated my life to, to Christ, there were things that had, I'm going to say, had to be changed if I was going to be a person that was going to really be a, a positive impact for Christ. And uh, one of the things was is that, you know, I was, I felt very, very self-centered. You know, everything revolved around Paul. The other thing was is that, you know, I had pretty coarse language. Um, during that period of my time in my life, and I didn't even think that much about it, but it wasn't, it wasn't healthy at all. And to be an example like that, I had to be transformed. And I was talking to Nathan about that last week. I said, you know what, in my own power, I know that I couldn't do that. You know, I just couldn't flip a switch and all of a sudden be changed. I remember having that discussion with, with God, saying, God, if, if, I, if I'm gonna be a useful instrument for you, you need to change me. I mean, that has to happen. And almost immediately, it, it stopped. And I looked at it, and, and I, as I started to reflect on it um, over the last couple of weeks, I realized it was because God said, this is who you are, and people like us don't do this. You're not going to be self-centered. You're not a self-centered person. You're going to be an other-centered person. You're not a coarse person. You're going to have a tender heart. Because people in my family, that is who you are, and that is what we do. And I realized that's a transformation that God does in our heart. He doesn't say, I want you to work harder. He says, you are a new person. You are transformed into a child of my family, and this is how we act, and this is what we do, and this is who we are. So I just wanted to share that with you today, um, because sometimes we wonder how God moves in our heart, and if you look back on, on the reflections of, of our lives, we realize God is moving and doing great and wonderful things, and that was a great and wonderful thing in my life that he did. In Romans 12, it's, it's a short passage, but there's not a lot of uh, verses that talk specifically about transformation. But this is one that does. So on page 947, Romans 12, starting verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So that sort of sets us up that this is what the expectation is of, of, of being part of God's family. And it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what it is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. God will do that for us. As part of his family, his children, he will establish in our mind, you are a loved child of mine. This is who you are, and this is what it's all about when you become a loved child of mine. And our life is transformed. So as we go out into the world, Understand that God, through the Holy Spirit, is always with, with us. He's always there to help and guide us. And that there are people out there that don't know about God's love yet. They have not accepted Christ. 
And our job is to let the Holy Spirit work through us as a transformed person so that those people have the ability to understand exactly what God is all about because God is pure love. We have a chance every week basically to remember what God has done for us. God has given us the greatest gift of all which is his love for eternity. To spend time with him, with a perfect father. But the only way to do that was to have a sacrifice that was significant enough that would allow us to be in God's presence. And that was God giving his only son a perfect lamb, a perfect sacrifice. So as we take communion today, and there are stations in the back, I'd like us to reflect on what has God done to us, done for us personally in the past, or maybe even very recently within the last couple of days, that we can just go to God and say, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for allowing me, as one of your children, to have eternal life with you, the greatest of all gifts. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Your plan goes beyond our comprehension. We don't, can't even wrap our arms around what that type of love is like to, to take a perfect son that you had without fault, without sin, and to have a plan that would mean that he would have to lay down his life so that we could be part of your family. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We pray that uh, our lives will be such that we are always willing to put you first in front of the needs that we may think we have. So as we take communion today, Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would touch our lives, touch our hearts, touch our minds, and help us to be even renewed today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
us all. Each week, uh, and really, I'm going to say continually, we have the ability to give back to God. Um, I'm going to say treasures that can be uh, time, talents, and finances. Um, and every day we should be looking at how we, we give back to God, you know, through the use of our time and our talents. Uh, also, financially, um, we have the ability to give back to God for his work. Um, and we can do that uh, either with a basket in the back, if you have checks or money that you want uh, to use on a weekly basis, or at uh, hopefranklin.org. If you choose to want to do it uh, that way, uh, you can set up and uh, pay online. But the biggest thing that I look at is God wants us to be cheerful. He wants us to, to desire to give to him. And again, it doesn't have to be financial. It has to. He really wants our time and our talents that he has blessed us with to do his work. We have a couple of uh, prayer requests this uh, this week. Mary Johnson's friend, uh, Karen, tested positive for COVID. Had a scary day. She is trying to stay out of the hospital, which is probably a, a very good thing. So who has that? Thank you. Mike and Pam Ewing's uh, granddaughter, Lily. Uh, Lydia, who... Uh, has the flu. Um, don't know how that's going. Oh, she was sitting in front of the toilet this morning, so she's okay, good. nauseous. Okay, good. Vomiting and just a fever and vomiting. And this, these are scary times. I mean, there are obviously this um, pandemic has uh, created a lot of scary times for a lot of people and changed a lot of people's lives right now. And, uh, we need to continue to pray that uh, this is something that we will uh, get figured out and we will be able to move through it. Um, and we need to pray for people that are at high risk uh, situations that aren't able to be with us um, because of the fact that that could potentially take their lives. So uh, any other prayer requests that we have? Okay, let's go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that part of your plan is that we can come to you. We don't have to come through an advocate. We can come directly to the throne with our prayers and our thoughts and our praises. We think of uh, Karen who has tested positive for COVID. Uh, we pray that uh, healing has already started within her body and that she's able to uh, deal with that uh, either as an outpatient type of person with uh, medication from her doctor. We pray that uh, she would not have to uh, end up going to the hospital for this, that, that her body would be able to recover on its own. We think of uh, Mike and Pam Ewing's granddaughters, uh, Lily and Lilia, um, who have the, the flu. Lord, we know that uh, our bodies are, are your temple, and we know that uh, when they get sick and when people get sick, that these are things that uh, really have an effect on, on your temple. We ask that uh, the greatest physician of all time, you, would just touch the, the bodies of these people that are, that are not doing well right now. And we know that there's a lot of prayer requests out there that are unspoken that we could say specifically deal with, uh, with health issues. And we would just ask that uh, you would put your, your hand down on them and bring relief to, to these bodies. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love for us. And we thank you that you've allowed us to be part of your family. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We have a uh, video coming up uh, for Veterans Day, so if, uh, just take a moment and look at that.
as powerful. Um, how many people in our congregation have been part of the uh, military services? Thank you. For those of us that have not been part of that, um, I can tell you it is difficult to understand the sacrifice that you've made, but we want to thank you for that. Um, it is beyond amazing what people do so that we in this country have freedom, because without your services, uh, that would not be possible. Mitchell, are you ready? Saturday, November 28th, we're going to be meeting at the church at 3, and we're going to drive downtown and do random acts of kindness around town. Uh, we're going to be handing out roses, blow in the dark balloons, uh, gas cards, and a bunch of other random acts of kindness that we'll be doing. Uh, everyone's welcome to come. You know, there's no, it's not just for the youth. If adults want to come too, uh, meet at the church at 3, and we'll be heading down there and just doing all that that night hoping to bless the town, you know, with God's love. Uh, we also printed off some random acts of kindness suggestion sheets. Uh, and we put them up at the information center. And this is just stuff that you can do on your own time. There's like a side that says for teens and a side that says like family edition that you can do with your family and stuff. And so those are over there at the information center. <clears throat> and if you think about it, Every day we almost have the uh, ability to, to do random acts of kindness. Um, I was talking, Vicki was mentioning me yesterday that uh, our neighbor, just is, you know, this time of year you live in the woods, you struggle with leaves. I mean, a lot of people struggle with leaves. <laughs> but when you live in the woods, you struggle with leaves. And, you know, she just went over and, you know, took her big blowers and just helped out. It's because, you know, we love people. We love people and we love our neighbors and uh, so God will always put these uh, opportunities in front of us and they're great. We should uh, listen to the Holy Spirit because a lot of times we get those type of promptings. Um, also, not on here, um, we are going to be doing Christmas caroling. Um, Carrie and I are going to coordinate that and if you're interested in, in helping with Christmas caroling as far as uh, participating, We'd love to just even talk to you a little bit afterwards, just so we can uh, put down a couple of dates that we can get in front of people. And uh, we'll do the rest as far as the coordination, but we'd like to know who might be doing that. Yes? Yeah, um, some of the dates that we're thinking about, but we'd love to hear folks' availability who would like to either the first Friday and Saturday of December, I think it's the fourth and the fifth, or either the second Friday and Saturday. So. If you're really interested in doing this, let us know if there's a date you're not available and that'll help us kind of pin down which date. And we will have, um, I've already picked out 12 wonderful Christmas carols that'll be on our, our uh, loop of, of carols that we sing. We'll have sh little booklets that we'll have put together for you. Pick out your favorite bright and colorful hat and scarf that you love to wear at that time of year and um, Nathan even has a little mini piano that he can like rig up around his neck <laughs> to help us along. You know, we've been talking about that. So. That alone is worth uh, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been trying to talk him into, I asked him the other day, I said, should we have Gary keep his eye out for an accordion? <laughs> and he's, so yeah, we we'd, we'd love to talk to you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have an accordion. Yeah, this is your moment then. All right. Oh, you do? I do. She said she has an accordion. Oh. So we'll, uh, <laughs> we'd love to, to speak with you afterwards if that'd be something they'd be interested in. Hey, on uh, Thursday mornings, we have men's group. We have a 6 o'clock and a 7.30. And uh, I'm going to tell you, I, I really enjoyed that. Since I've retired, uh, I've really enjoyed getting together with, uh, you know, some of my brothers. Where's Dennis at? <laughs> okay. 
So I usually Dennis and I sit next to each other, and we uh, and uh, we have some <coughs> talks, and we like that. Um, so if if you have those that time that's opened up, man, uh, I'm gonna tell you it's well worth your time. Also on uh, Thursday evenings at 6:30, uh, we have a prayer group, and I'm gonna tell you right now, prayer warriors are are a really big deal. <laughs> I mean, that is the greatest thing. I mean, if you think about the greatest gift that you can give somebody is true and honest prayer uh, when there's something that's going on in their life uh, because you're connecting right up with God, and there's no one, obviously, more powerful than God. So um, he calls us to pray every day. Pray continually, not just every day. Pray continually. But uh, if you're interested in participating on Thursday evenings, what a great opportunity for that. Next, um, be the light, Matthew 14, and is that new series or? No, the it's pictures a... that follow will. Okay. So this, oh, thank you, Nathan. So the be the light, the, the, I love this idea of the uh, baskets. And I can tell you the ones that uh, we had chance to take out what a what a neat thing um, just to see people's faces uh, when they receive those baskets because they were really really cool. Joyce sent a card. I forgot to bring it, but she sent a very nice thank you card. Okay, she's yeah. there in the red. Well, Diane told me uh, yep. Pam, that her she was very touched. Uh, Ran, no, Pam told me that Diane was. Yeah, except it was, yeah. And, and so the people that coordinated that, that, Christina, thank you so much for that because I, just to see people's faces light up, that was so cool. So Operation, Operation Christmas Child, uh, we're going to be doing the packing on November 22nd. And if you participated that in the past, that is really fun. It really is. Uh, We've had uh, everything from young kids helping pack to, I'm going to say, people in their 80s and 90s. So, I mean, it is really, really cool. And if you think about touching the life of somebody outside of, um, you know, our country, that they don't have what we have, a little shoebox can make all the difference in the world. we got a video on that, too. Okay, we have a video to watch on that. I've had a lot of people tell me I'm lucky, but I tell them I'm chosen. My name is Karabo Norezlan. I was born in Lesotho, Southern Africa, and was raised in the villages. When I was about five years old, I lost my father, and not long after my father's death, my mother left me at my grandmother's house and I never saw her for years. So my grandmother became a mother. She told me a lot of things, including how to read and write. But most importantly, she told me about God. Loneliness in my life began when I lost my grandma, the woman who raised me. I had to say goodbye to my love, to my grandmother. Then a year after my grandma's passing, my mother also passed away. I was faced with the sad reality of being an orphan, which is something that I dreaded the most. I had a home and a house in the villages, but I had no parents. I was alone. My uncle brought me into his home in the city. It was there in the city that I, I met a friend, actually. He invited me to a church. There was a truck filled with his shoeboxes. I received a shoebox myself. I remember that shoebox filled one of the holes in my heart, and there was the whole bucket in something that belongs to me. I had lost everything, so the gift of the box gave me that hope this belongs to me, and it really filled my heart. I realized God gave me what I was always in need of. I made a choice to personally seek Him. Today, I have a family and I'm no longer an orphan. I know 
am chosen. Someone took their time to work hard and to pick my shoebox and God used them to give me hope and to feel what my heart was in need of. So today, if you hear the voice of God, do not harden your heart. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So I'm asking you to go prepare a gift today. Take a shoebox, give someone hope and love somebody today and spread the gospel. impact we make okay so um, there's a community Thanksgiving dinner um, that takes place every year and I'm going to tell you this year um, everything is sort of different because of the fact of COVID so Christina has uh, made contacts with uh, people around the community and um, we're going to really sort of take that over this year. We need to have volunteers to help. Uh, it's going to be, uh, we're going to have to-go meals. We need to prep those. Uh, it's going to be noon until 2 p.m. on Wednesday, November 25th. So uh, if, I'd, I'd ask that you get with Christina and figure out uh, how that might work uh, to participate in that. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for people that, uh, that these meals touch that we have the ability to do that. So uh, again, uh, get with Christine in the back by the, uh, uh, the booth back there and, and that will uh, allow us to be able to do that this year. <clears throat> Camp Barakel, Barakel Winter Retreat. Every year we, get, we, you know, we have the ability to have our youth participate in that. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the, the pictures that come back from that and the stories are just absolutely wonderful. So that's going to take place uh, January 15th through the 17th of 2021. I uh, need to be thinking about uh, uh, registering for that and, and getting involved with that. And uh, again, <coughs> if the youth have uh, had as much, if they end up having as much fun this time as they've had in the past, it's going to be a highly successful retreat. Anybody have a story that they'd like to share today? Okay, and what I would say is God gives us the opportunity almost continually to think about things that how God has been doing for us. And I'm going to tell you, stories are powerful. And stories are personal. And God does it this way because I think God wants us to understand that we are not a, a collective group of people that all have the same experiences. We are very personally individual. We are special and personal to God. And he will give us opportunities. He will give us circumstances in our lives that are extremely personal. And those stories can be extremely powerful when you share those with uh, the people around you. And it doesn't have to be the church family. It can be people outside these walls when God prompts you to, to share a story. So I just ask you to think about that uh, because they are powerful. Thank you, Paul. So, as you guys know, if you've been here, our series is called Relational Parenting. And this applies to all of us, even if our kids are long gone. Because what we are learning is how to imitate in our relationships how God parents us. The message that uh, I'm going to share with you today was supposed to be uh, two weeks from now. But in light of all of the things that have been going on in our world, in our country, um, it seemed to me appropriate that a message called Returning to Joy When Life is Hard would be good to do 
this Sunday. So that's what we're going to do. And Paul, your introduction, even if not planned to be an introduction for this message, was very appropriate. I leaned over and said to Jeannie when he was sharing in the, the beginning before the scripture reading, Paul gets it. Um, basically, the series uh, at its core is uh, sharing uh, some insights, um, some uh, intersection of what has been discovered in brain science in the last 20 years and what the Bible tells us God is uh, interested in and what Christian maturity looks like. And so as Paul described how he uh, got rid of bad language, not by realizing it was bad and he shouldn't do it and trying hard to not do what he knew was bad, but actually by seeing himself differently, his identity changed, and as a result of his identity changing, the power to not speak those words was released. And the reason that is, now God knew all this, he created our brains, but it took brain scientists in the last 20 years to tell us some of the background as to why this is. And the reason is because our right system operates faster than conscious thought. And if we're depending on our left system to change us, we will say the word, then realize we said it, and feel bad about ourselves. But we can't get out in front of it because we don't, re you know, it's happening at the speed of thought, and it's already happened. Whereas if our identity changes, and we literally start seeing ourselves more clearly and accurately from God's perspective, who he tells us that we are, and we start getting examples of what that looks like, what people like us, those who are uh, God's redeemed and loved children, what people like us live like, then we start doing things, saying things, responding to things in real time before we even, if you want to say, notice what we're doing. And then we can kind of reflect on it afterwards, but we've already done the good thing or not said the bad thing that we used to do. So basically, this series is about that in, in all of our lives, in terms of God's parenting of us and how, what it looks like for us to literally be transformed, mature, as his followers. But uh, in God's uh, creative wisdom, he makes the job of parenting just be an imitation of his job of parenting us. So if we just do with our kids, with our friends, with the people that God has put into our circles of influence, the same things that God is doing with us, we will, if, if you could say as far as it depends on us, we will be helping them become mature. And so that's basically what the series is about. And just to give it just a real quick, um, I guess, essence of, of this, uh, beyond what I just said, uh, the reality is we experience joy, love, and identity in our brain's right system, which is the one that's faster than conscious thought. It always has a, a current internal picture of who I am. God, we don't have to think about it. We don't have to try to do it. Your right system has an identity picture. It may not be the right one, but everything that you do faster than conscious thought is going to flow out of whatever identity you currently hold of yourself. The second thing the right system does is it, it is, and this happens about 12 or 13 years old when uh, we change from being a child to being an adult, our orientation is increasingly around who are my people? Who are my people? And so that's why in, in situations where there's low joy and no relational connections within family units, the youth, the teenagers, will look for people outside of their family. And so that's why you have uh, gangs and things like that, because those kids are looking for their people. They're looking for someone they can say, these are my people. Now, unfortunately... <laughs> When that happens, if your people are doing stuff that people shouldn't do, your right system is so oriented to wanting to be part of that people that when you see them doing the stuff that's not supposed to be done, you'll think to yourself, this is who I am. 
these are my people, this is what people like us do. You don't think to yourself, you don't go into a seminar and says, how can I be a really bad person as part of this gang? You don't have to think about it, you don't have to try hard to do it, you just hang out with people doing stuff that shouldn't be done, and feeling like they care about you, and your natural orientation will be to start doing the kind of things they do. On the good side, if in fact our identity starts becoming transformed and clarified and in alignment with reality, the reality of God's truth given to us in his word and presented to us in a real person, Jesus Christ, who did everything that needed to be done to free human beings, then the reverse of what I described with the gangs can actually happen, and we actually can be transformed from the inside out as our identity becomes more and more clearly aligned with Jesus Christ, who we are in him, and what he has provided for us through relational interactions with our people. Now, the children of God, our brothers and sisters in Christ, our loving Heavenly Father, and our advocate and helper, the Holy Spirit, our King and Savior, Jesus Christ, who literally is in heaven, making intercession for us, defending us before the Father when we are accused by the evil one. And if we start picturing that and, and kind of like embracing it fully, amazing things can happen in terms of our transformation, in terms of what we look like. So that, for example, when the early church, uh, the followers of Jesus were described, they said, we know they are Christians because of their love. The kinds of things they did for one another, other simple acts of kindness and love that the culture had no explanation for, they associated that with they must be Jesus followers. Because normal people or our kind of people don't do stuff like that. The whole concept of humility, which is ingrained in our culture now, at least to some degree, it, maybe we're losing some of that, but the idea that it is a highly valued thing to uh, think of other people before ourselves was completely unknown before Christianity and before Jesus Christ. The Roman culture and everyone's assumed uh, the way that things are, reality as they saw it, was to be lovers of honor. What do I have to do that I would be honored? And so the, the love of honor is almost like you could say the opposite of the, the biblical Christian view of the love to serve, the willingness to be lower than other people, not because we believe that we're lower than other people, but because we believe God is pleased, that's what people like us do. So the three things our right system is always doing, and God doesn't have, this is coded into our brains by God, so that we are born with this. Who am I? Who are my people? What do people like us do? So if we can correct, align with reality, maybe would be a better way of saying it, the, the answers to those three questions, then what flows out faster than conscious thought will be increasingly what pleases Jesus, what followers of Jesus do, what other people notice and say, where did that come from? How could that person do that? How could they respond to the situation that I know they're in in their life in that kind of a way? And so Peter says, and Paul says, essentially the same thing in different passages, always be ready to give an answer to people when they ask you about the hope that you have. Assuming, of course, these people have hope. <laughs> They're doing stuff that's hope-filled in situations that have no basis for that to be the way that you would respond as the culture would normally look at it. And so when the Christians have hope, when other people don't, other people are curious. And they say, what's up with you? How do you have this attitude? Where is this coming from? And so both Paul and Peter say, 
Just tell them your story. Tell them what's true. Tell them what's going on. Tell them how it is that you can have this kind of hope. So, our sense of identity is the most powerful influence on how we act and react in the various situations that will cross our paths as we journey through our lives, which will include, as Jesus told us, trouble. In this life, you will have trouble. Any teaching that someone would present to you from God that says, trust Jesus so you can avoid trouble, forgot that Jesus said that. Or they're intentionally ignoring it, because that is not the message of the gospel, that following Jesus uh, puts us in a position where trouble and difficulties and challenges and pain and heartache will not be our experience. It does put us in a place, on the other hand, that we can literally say, in the midst of those difficult things, I can have hope. I can continue to have joy. I can give of myself to those in my life, to other people, sacrificially, out of goodness, beauty, love, kindness, the fruit of the Spirit. So, uh, it operates so fast. This is why it works, because it operates so fast, pre-consciously, six times a second, that we can be unaware of its presence. Now, negatively, it can operate so fast if we don't have it aligned that we're doing those things and then notice that we did it and then feel bad about it, feel shame or whatever. And so that can be there as well. And so uh, my desire, my hope with this series is that more and more we will find ourselves embracing reality, understanding who we are, embracing who we are as a people, who God's people are, every brother and sister in Christ around the world are our brothers and sisters. And we will increasingly start just letting, as Jesus said, if you drink the water I have to give you, out from you will flow streams of living water. Which I believe he's basically describing the right system, acting faster than conscious thought, and just sharing goodness, beauty, love, joy, those kind of things, because that's who I am. And that's what people like us do. So, what should people like us remember when our lives get hard? And when we feel like God isn't paying attention? One of the things the right system does and is great at is imitation. What it is not great at and does not do is uh, say it in words. Uh, so uh, the right system is not verbal. The left system is where we come up with, like for me to give this message today, it has to go from my right system, hopefully reality, truth, all that stuff, to the left system. How do I say this? How do I share it with other people? What things do I put on my slides here to, to look at? And then how am I going to share it? But the right system itself is not verbal. But what it's looking for are examples, pictures, illustration. One of the tremendous values and power of God's word is that he, it's, it's, I don't know what percentage of it is stories, but it's a massive amount of the scriptures are basically stories. This happened, this difficult situation, and sometimes people respond well, and sometimes they don't respond well. And when they don't respond well, you know what Paul tells us we should do with it? We should notice what they did, how it turned out, so that we wouldn't repeat their mistakes. So whether it's a, positive, a negative example or a positive example, our right system can pay attention to it, note it, and say, uh, basically what your right system is always doing is when something happens and you go through all of the, your memories of everything that's happened to you and everything that you have observed other people doing and even everything you've observed people in the scriptures doing or that you've imagined yourself doing if an opportunity like this would come up with that's kind of becomes a, a thing in your mind it's almost like a uh, even though it hasn't happened yet you pictured it happening and you imagine what you might do in that situation. And then a situation comes and it's like, 
oh, I remember that thing I imagined maybe I would do if a situation like this came up, and then you do it. If you don't have any pictures, any examples, any illustrations of what this looks like, you literally are like flying blind, because like you're right, this is this. There's nothing there. I don't know how to respond to this situation. I don't know what to do when this happens, because I don't have any pictures to pull from and say, what should I do? And the maturing brain of a right system, for, uh, the maturing right system of a person who's a follower of Jesus, will increasingly want to do things that would be what would please Jesus, or like, what would people like us do? And increasingly, you're going to go, of all the options I see, I want to pick the one that I think is most in alignment with what a follower of Jesus would do. And so the, the value of that is increasing those pictures. And where do we get the pictures? I, I mentioned to you here, but the other way we get the pictures is watching each other. You know how our kids get their picture? As bad as it might be when we do this. <laughs> You know, when we give them the negative example, it's like, don't do that thing that your dad just did. You know, some people think the way to do it is say, oh, don't do what I do, just listen to what I say. But guess what the right system can't do? It can't process words. Uh, it, it can't negate the picture by, with words. The only way it can negate that picture is either to give it a negative connotation this is what people like us don't do, or give it a positive example in contrast to that. We don't do this, but we do do this. And there's no more powerful way to do that than for a parent, for example, to say to their children, you know what dad just did right then? You know how he snapped at your mom when she asked that question? Really, that's not something people like us do. Papa needs to, or daddy needs to, Admit to Jeannie that that wasn't a loving thing to do. Ask her forgiveness and try to be restored, reconciled, because that's what people like us do. And so now the child has, I saw my dad lose his temper with my snap at his wife or whatever. I saw that. I also saw how he reacted when he realized that what he had done was wrong. And I also saw how he attempted to make it right as far as it depended on him. Wife could still say, I'm going to be angry with him for the next two days. We are not talking. I don't care if he confessed. I don't care if he asked forgiveness. I'm going to still hold that against him. The kid can see that too. Sometimes people do the right thing and other people don't respond the way they should. What do we do then? And so he's watching dad. So everything about your life, and this can be both a positive potential and a really bad thing to realize because we realize a lot of stuff we do we don't want our kids imitating or we don't want our friends imitating or we don't want other people imitating but that's how God made us to, to be seeing to be noticing to be looking at those things so what should people like us remember think about reflect on when our lives get hard and we feel God isn't paying attention now, we just had an election in our country. I can't imagine there's anyone here that does not know that. <laughs> Some people wanted the current president to continue being president. And some people wanted a regime change or a change in things. And then it's like, it's not been declared officially yet. Some networks have said they think they know who did it. But literally, we don't know yet how this is all going to play out and what's going to happen, even if it plays out the way you know, the, the networks are saying, it's got, and some people believe life as I know it is going to be over on both sides, depending on how that goes. That's one of the reasons I switched this from two weeks from now to now. But also with COVID, this, I don't know when it was, Monday was when, was that when school got shut down again? Yeah. Monday. So Franklin goes back to school, everything's going good. A couple of teachers get exposed to someone who had COVID or something. I think that's what happened. And now all of a sudden, everyone's got to say, okay, now we're back home, virtual. My kids are in my house. I got to rethink my job, my daycare or whatever. I mean, literally life as they thought, they knew it even in the midst of COVID, it's completely been turned upside down again. 
So sometimes stuff happens. There could be a health diagnosis. There could be someone that you, a marriage situation is very challenging, a child and is completely seems to not want to, to buy into anything mom and dad say is important or valued. So how should people like us, followers of Jesus, and I'm assuming as we speak here, not that everyone here is a follower of Jesus, but that you're here with followers of Jesus, so the message you're going to hear is one, this is what followers of Jesus think about, talk about, and consider important. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I would just say, no better day than today to trust Christ as your personal Savior. So how should we follow to Jesus? What should we do? What should we think about? What should we remember when our lives get hard and we feel that God isn't paying attention? Because often it can seem like, do you not know? Have you not heard? So, this passage in Isaiah. And again, this is one of the values of Scripture. And one of the reasons I'm bringing them to you because I'm giving you a picture of how people like us can use the Scriptures to think about a, a way, one of the memories or possibilities we can have in our mind is we could respond like Isaiah did when people were asking that question. Does God know? Does he, is he like aware of what's going on? Verse 27 of Isaiah 40. Why do you say, O Jacob, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? There's rights that I have. There's a path that I'm on. And it's like God doesn't seem to be aware of what's going on here. A couple of verses later. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. Oh, I'm supposed to wait for the Lord, even in the midst of circumstances that seem not the way I want them to be. Seems like God's not paying attention. But if I wait for the Lord, I, he promises that I will renew my strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And then a few verses later in chapter 41 and verse 10, he says, Fear not, telling these people that are thinking God's not paying attention, Fear not, God says, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So, um, I didn't know exactly where to put these in, but I just decided to throw them in right here. So I just wanted to give you three practices that in the reading I've done in this whole arena, the intersection between uh, following Jesus and becoming mature and what they're learning from brain science is that our brains are literally fueled by joy or by fear. And fear is a very... Uh, if we're fueled by fear, we will decrease the joy in the lives of the people that are around us. It's almost like we're sucking the joy out of life for them. If we are fueled by joy, we have the opposite effect. We actually are infusing into their lives a joy that they may not be in touch with in that moment. So we have the potential of being, you know, that... Streams of living water can flow out of We can literally be infusing joy into people's lives or just imagine yourself with a saw, with a straw, sucking the joy out of the lives of the people that we come in contact with. If, that's, if we're oriented and being fueled in this present moment by fear, and the six big fear emotions, fear-based emotions that are hardwired into the human brain are fear, Sadness, anger, shame, disgust, and hopeless despair. If what is driving us at any moment is one of those six fear-based or fear-rooted uh, emotions, then what we are going to be doing is we're going to try to be God to ourselves, which is the essential sin of human beings, is I don't want to have to depend on God. I want to be God to myself. And if what is driving us is fear, one of those six big uh, unpleasant emotions, then we will, um, 
it's not that we don't admit those emotions and experience them, which I'll talk about a little bit, but we, we must, as soon as possible, return to joy. The joy of the identity of who we are, no matter how bad things are. So what fueled Jesus on the cross? Can't get in a worse situation than that. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Joy fueled Jesus on the cross. Not hopeless despair, not anger. He's on the cross and he's thinking about making sure mom is taken care of. So he asked John to make sure to take care of mom. Not, you know, I'm the oldest son and I'm leaving. Uh, could you make sure that, that Mary's taken care of? That's what he's thinking about. He's still thinking about other people. He's thinking about the thief on the cross that that's, has a heart to respond and thinking, you shouldn't be up here. What are you doing up here? I should be up here. I did a bad thing. You shouldn't be up here. And they had this little conversation and Jesus basically invites the person to trust him and he says, this day you will be with me in paradise. That's what he's thinking about while he's on the cross. He's thinking about other people. So here's three practices that all of us can do and I'll just tell you I have been doing this I've been practicing these things I don't know if you guys have noticed it but <laughs> I have it some of them you wouldn't necessarily notice but others I, I've been practicing here practice letting your face light up when you are with each other the literal definition of joy is the feeling or the sense that other people are happy to be in my presence. And that includes God. So one, the more we sense that God is happy to be with us and us with him, the more joy we feel in our relationship with God. The more we feel with another person or a group of people, they're happy to be here with me. The more we feel joy, because that's the essence of relational joy, is the sense that other people are glad, happy. We, we raise their day, the, the quotient of their day by our presence with them versus not being there with them. So paying attention to face lighting up delight when we see each other again is a powerful free gift married couples can give to each other. Jeannie and I are practicing that. Good morning. So good to see you again. I'm so glad we're married to each other. <laughs> Parents with their kids. Every time our grandkids come again to our house, I have been very intentional about making the first interaction with them be something like that. Harrison, so good to see you. And it's so interesting because Harrison's a little bit aloof for like two or three minutes. It's like... He's not like, yeah, yay. It's like, what are you doing right now? <laughs> but then at lunchtime last week, Jeannie watches Harrison two days a week for, for Rebecca, who's a professor at Oakland University. And so uh, I'm up in my office, and Jeannie gets lunch ready. And so uh, she goes, uh, she calls me Papa when Harrison's there, or when any of the grandkids are there. Papa, time for lunch. You know what Harrison did? Papa! It's like, he hardly ever says words. So to hear him say not only a word, but in essence, his name for me, it's like, well, that felt good. So I come down for lunch. We have these benches that sit at our island in our kitchen. So Harrison's all set up. Jeannie's got his food in front of him and everything. He's ready to go. And I come down from my office because he just called up, you know, Papa, it's time for lunch. You know what he did? He points to the stool beside him. It's like, this is where I want you to be, Papa. Right beside me. So he warmed up. Now, when I first greet him, I still am happy to see him, but he's not necessarily happy to see me. But by the time lunchtime comes, what he's thinking about is, who do I want to be really close to me while we eat lunch together? And it's my papa. That is joy. It's joy for me, and I actually look over at him, and I'm thinking, he's having fun too. He likes having his papa sit right next to him while we eat lunch. 
And so we have a tradition because this is what people like us do. Let's thank the Lord for our lunch, Harrison. He's looking at me like, what's he doing right now? Why does he do that every day at lunchtime? <laughs> he's just kind of looking up at me. And so he doesn't eat while I'm doing this. He doesn't, he's not distracted. He's paying clear attention. And I can tell you this. That's going in the memory banks as a picture of something, at least an option of one of the things you could do before you eat. Some people, like my papa, they do this before they eat a meal. It's not something to feel guilty about or bad about if you don't do it. That's not the way this stuff works. It's just like a picture of what it could look like for someone who feels loved by God, feels like a dearly loved child of God, and is now sitting down for a meal, and thank you, Lord, for giving us food that we can eat, and cars that drive, and a roof over our head. That's about as long as the prayers that I do when Harrison's there. <laughs> that might be even a little longer than, you know, I might pick one of those things, and for the food, and for Grammy preparing for us, in Jesus' name, amen. So, Church and community gatherings are more joy-building when we share face lighting up greetings with one another, especially the first time we see someone when we gather. So some of you, I don't know if you noticed it, but I, I've been, it's not that I didn't do it sometimes, but I've tried to make, like say, this is something I want to do. This is what people like us do. When we see each other and we haven't seen each other before, we want to be happy and let the person see that we're happy, see in our face that we're happy to see them. So, uh, Angus, I'm going to use a story on you if you don't mind. So, uh, Angus is, uh, lives in the area, and I was going over to their house one day, and uh, Eznip comes to the door, and I said, well, I'm here to see Angus about something. And so she yells up, hey, Papi, <laughs> Pastor here to see you. So I said, I'm going to call him Poppy from now on. Because <laughs> I know that's what people who love him call him Poppy. So now every time I see Angus, and I haven't seen him before, I don't just smile and light up. I actually say, Poppy, good to see you. And for some reason, I use a Grenadian accent, though that has no connection to the accent from Haiti. Reminds me of my brother, Ruben, who was a student at Spring Harbor College when I was there. And both of us grew up in the West Indies, and we have this little West Indian dialect thing that we can pull up when we want to. And so Reuben had an Ethiopian roommate, and he would always talk to the Ethiopian unit, uh, roommate with the Grenadian dialect. And I told him, he's from Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> they don't talk like that, but he just saw the color of his skin, and so he's just going into the way he talked in Grenada when he was around people with, with different colored skin. That's just kind of in his, <laughs> the way, you know, that's what people like us do, I guess, he thought. So, uh, here's an interesting note, and I would just say, uh, take note of it and do what you sense God would have you do with this. They are finding that there is a direct, inverse proportional correlation between screen time and relational joy when you're in the presence of another person. The more you spend time looking at the screen when you're with someone else, the less joy they will sense from you and vice versa. Just say it. So when you think about it, I know most of us, what we do is, you know, we'll, we'll be distracted by our screen and then someone maybe will say something. Well, excuse me for talking or something. You know, kind of a, a shaming or rebuking comment because they feel the lack of connection, lack of joy. They say something, then we feel bad about ourselves. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Shouldn't be doing that. But see, that's conscious thought speed. That's not faster than conscious thought. So for this literally to change, what we have to start embracing is people like us don't let ourselves become distracted with our screens when we're in the presence of someone else that we want to be experiencing relational joy with. Then we start doing it if you want to say faster than conscious thought. We don't let ourselves catch ourselves after we've done it. We start catching ourselves before we do it and choosing not to do it because we value the person's relationship. 
Uh, second practice is uh, pay attention to joyful memories from your story. The people that have been into this more than I have uh, say they have found amazing impact from doing this. And I've been doing it uh, some a month maybe now. So uh, joyful memories. So here's my journal. I don't write in it every day. Several times a month, maybe more than that sometimes. On the back page, joy memories. Trusting Christ while listening to a radio preacher in March of 1963. If you think that because your parents are serving God as a pastor or a missionary that you're going to go to heaven when you die, think again. There are no, Jesus has no grandchildren, I'm thinking. That's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> if anyone's going to heaven, it's going to be me because we're, we're living in the, in the West Indies as missionaries. I mean, who does that? Surely I'm going to go to heaven. And so this guy basically cut down everything I was thinking that was my, you know, base of operations or assumed acceptance by God. And he basically presented the gospel, I trust your Christ as a 10-year-old kid listening to a guy on the radio. That's a joy memory. Several joy uh, soccer mem memories. I mentioned the one about Bryce when he was afraid to jump off the diving board. I'm going to face my fear, Papa. And then he jumps off and he goes in. He comes up, he looks right at me, and he goes, I am so proud of myself right now. <laughs> I just, it's joyful to me to think about that. Not because, to think about it because that's what God thinks about us when we face something that we're fearful about or when we change something that we used to do. He could have been locked up by that and never jumped off a diving board in his whole life and gone to his grave. But he did not want to live that way, and so he faced his fear. And you know, even when he you know, like got a little weak knee there, for, he goes into it. So, um, one of the ones, uh, number thirteen for you elders, sitting at an elder supper with our whole community elders and seeing them enjoy being with each other. Some of you are here. You know what that's like. This is not the typical board meeting uh, feel. This is a bunch of guys that just like to hang out and we'll talk about some stuff and make some decisions that need to be made. But at the essence and at the core of what is going on there is people are hap who are happy to be in each other's presence. So there is a relational joy and it gives me relational joy to see that happening. Um, I, I just wrote this one down this morning, the one I shared with you about Harrison calling out Papa. <laughs> you know, like, this is where I want you to be, Papa, right beside me. So what I'd encourage you to do is every time you think of something from your story, that when you think about it, it just brings joy to your heart. And then uh, consciously associate the fact of that joy with the way God feels about you. That there's a, a relational joy in his relationship with you that we often can not even imagine is there. And so it's not just that it's joyful, it's that it's joyful and it kind of reminds us and puts us in the context of the kind of relationship we have with God. And then five minutes in the beginning of your day, when you first get up, Sometime in the middle of the day, like lunchtime or something like that, just spend five minutes thinking of some of those joy memories. The people that have done this a lot say they, they can do about two or three memories, and they just kind of go back to that time, and they remember what it was like, and remember what the person did. One just popped in my mind. Uh, I was playing soccer, and I, I told this story before, but you, you may not have heard this, but uh, the other team almost scored a goal, and the coach, for some reason, thought it was because of something I had not done. I don't know what he was looking at, but no one else on the field thought that was true, and I certainly didn't think it was true. But he pulls me out of the game like, and starts, you know, what were you doing or why did you do that? It's like, I'm thinking, what did you see that I didn't see? As I recall, the ball went about 10 feet over my head, you know, so it was like, no way I'm jumping up 10 feet to head a ball. I'm not sure what you had in mind, but... 
that wasn't going to happen. And so then one of my friends said, Coach is literally like an arm's length away from me, and he's in the midst of like yelling at me. And my friend said, that's okay, Nate. You did the right thing. Guess where the heat got turned to? He literally kicked him off the team in the middle of the game. He's walking off the field. The good part of the story is almost everyone on the team went to the coach after the game and said, Coach, you were wrong on that. that whatever you thought happened isn't what happened. And so he went and apologized to my friend, reinstated him to the team. So he basically lost like half a game, you know, in terms of his soccer career. But it could have been much worse. He literally was willing to sacrifice himself, you know, if you want to say, his place on the team, his possible future in soccer to defend a friend who was being falsely accused, mistreated, whatever, that is not an easy thing to do. Now, when someone does that, and you remember it, which every time I remember it, it brings emotion to me and joy, because I think, that was really cool. Those are the kind of things I want to do for other people, even at risk to myself, if they are being falsely accused, if someone's going after someone they shouldn't be going after someone, I want to be the guy that's willing to like lose something important to do the right thing. It's hard to think of that ahead of time. You have to do it in the moment. And I'm sure my friend John did not like think about, now if Nathan ever gets accused sometime in the future of doing something wrong and the coach is really yelling at him, I think what I'll do is defend him and then get kicked off. And, He's not thinking that. He's just doing, it's like, that's my friend that's being attacked there. I'm going to defend him. And then the rest of it played out. He didn't know that it was going to turn out well. So pay attention to joyful memories as often as possible. I'm not saying you have to limit yourself to three times a day, but it's a good practice. And once you do it, you'll start getting in the habit of it. If you do this, they basically suggest doing it for 30 days. Just practicing. When you first get up in the morning, start thinking of your joyful, uh, two or three joyful memories in the middle of the day and then before you go to bed at night. The one guy that wrote the book that the elders are reading now, uh, the, the Other Side of Church, uh, Michael Hendricks, who is a pastor of discipleship in Lawrence Church, he said he has grown more in his Christian walk in the last two years once he's started like thinking about and processing this intersection between Christian maturity and brain science than he grew from the time he was converted till two years ago. And one of the things he's been doing is he gets up and thinks about his joy memories five minutes a day, in the middle of the day, at the end of the day. And here's what he said. I find myself being more joyful all the time. Not because I'm trying to be more joyful, I'm just more joyful. That's actually been my experience too. And I've only been at it for about a month. So the third thing is pay attention to uh, gratitude and practice sharing it. It kind of goes along with the one before. Um, joyful memories and gratitude. We should be grateful for joyful memories. So um, when you start being over-focused on a problem or a fear-based concern, an uncertain future, a behavioral issue of someone else that you sure like to see change. Be aware that we can make it seem like these things are more important to us than relationships. There can be something that we are so churned up about that it can appear, and especially if it's the person that's doing it that feels it, they can feel me changing or me performing or me not doing that is more important to that person than I am to that person, than my relationship is to that person. We can get distracted by fear-based concerns even when they are with someone that we had identify as my people. As a counter to this tendency, we can start paying attention to and practicing sharing things we are grateful about other people and maybe particularly about the person whose behavior we are irritated by. 
That irritation right now does not define who they are. They're a big pile of a bunch of stuff. Some of it is irritating. But there's a lot of it that is not. And there's a lot of it that we're tremendously grateful for and appreciative of. And if we will begin focusing on those things, we can, in the context of our relational commitment to one another, we are people together. People like us don't do this. We can actually talk about stuff that's irritating with relationship being the foundation, not correcting that thing being the foundation. So, an idea. With your family or with a group that you get together with, uh, do a, a regular, like once a week, family night or something like that. Take turns sharing something each is grateful for about others that are present. And as parents, you can just start doing that. Even It doesn't have to be you know, family night. It, when our kids were growing up, Thursday night was family night. And we had routines that we did, and this could have been one of our routines. But parents, other people, friends, you can start looking for things about other people that make you joyful that you, when you think about it, and you can say it out loud. I noticed this about you. So we were with our friends, the Headleys, down in Louisville, Kentucky last week. And I was talking about some of this stuff with Jim and Jenny. A couple of things they said, they said, we don't have any other friends that we talk to about these kind of things like we do with you. It's like they felt like they go deeper and more relational with us than with any other friends in their life. And we only see them about once a year for a day and a half. And we tax and do other stuff. But some people could just know that and think that but not say it. But they said it. So it was like that. That was a joyful, a grateful, joyful thing. When I told Jim about the, the joy memories, and I told him I wrote them on my journal, he said, can I take a picture of that? <laughs> so he literally opens up my journal and takes a picture to, to give him some ideas, some pictures, to say, oh, okay, that gives me an idea of a memory I can put in my thing. So, it's just a good idea. So, I would just encourage us to be uh, really tuned in to this idea of who we are, our identity, and who our people are, and what people like us do, and just start practicing these kind of things, and like enjoy being a love child of God, and being who you are in Him, and let it flow out of you, rather than being at something you're really trying hard to do. And you're worried about what other people think about how good you're doing at what you're trying hard to do. Lord, thank you so much for this gift that we have of being your dearly loved children. And that you fill us with your spirit and give us the fruit of your spirit, which is love, joy, peace. May that be what flows out of us in our interactions with each other even those in our circle of awareness, our relationships that are not believers, and that they would be asking us questions that we could joyfully respond to. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. See you next week. <laughs>